If you're here to learn how to use the Moment app, then you're in the right place. Let's do it. My name is David Addison and welcome to my Moment app tutorial. Now this is a very long and detailed tutorial, but I've included lots of timestamps to help you. So feel free to skip around to the part you need. And after you've watched it, you should have the knowledge and the confidence to create the photos, the videos, and the time lapses that you want. Because this isn't just a, here's the flash, here's the histogram, here's the camera switcher type of tutorial. No, it is more of a, here's the histogram, here's how to use it, here's how I use it, here's how you might want to use it type of video. And as usual with a tutorial, I'm not one of the developers. I don't know the developers. I've not been in contact with the developers. They didn't contribute to this tutorial one little bit. Everything I say is my own opinion and is to the best of my knowledge. So if I get something wrong or I leave something out, then feel free to let me know in the comments below. And if I feel that it's worth including and once I've verified it, I will leave an update in the description. And if you are having issues like crashes or errors, don't report them to me. Reporting them to me won't get you very far. You're better off reporting them to this email address right here. So with the Moment app downloaded, let's open it for the first time and get set up. When you open the app for the first time, it's going to ask to use Bluetooth. And this is so it can connect to the gimbals it's compatible with, Bluetooth microphones, Bluetooth headphones, Moment's own cases, as it says, things like that. So just tap OK and then give it all of the permissions. Now, while this tutorial does look cool and it is useful, you can skip it because that's why I'm here. But if you are a beginner, Moment's daily emails are worth signing up to because they contain some really useful links to even more video and written content. And with that said, welcome to the Moment app. This is the user interface as you'll see it for the first time. And this little icon in the bottom right indicates we are in photo mode. And you can switch between the modes by tapping the icon and choosing the one you'd like. I will, of course, get to all of them, but right now we're going to stay in photo mode. And if you've been around a camera or a camera app before, then a lot of these icons will be familiar to you. We've got the flash, off, on and automatic, so the flash will fire when it thinks it's needed. We've got the timer, off, three seconds and 10 seconds. And we've got some image formats, which can be customized as we'll get to in a minute. This green dot means an app is currently using the camera, which of course it is. This beautiful collection of lines is your live histogram. And lastly, on the top row, we've got Moments Lens Selection, with each of these letters referring to a specific moment lens. Down here, we have the selfie camera switcher. And if you have a phone with multiple cameras, like a telephoto or an ultra wide, you'll be able to switch between those here as well. And underneath, we have our manual controls, starting with the shutter speed, then ISO, exposure value compensation or EV, focus and white balance. So before we use any of this functionality, let's do some housework in the settings and set the app up to your own personal workflow. And you can do that by tapping here to go into the settings. Now I will cover all of the settings, but if I skip past something or don't mention it, then don't worry. I am going to come back to it a little bit later on when the time is right. So first of all, let's go down to the general settings and location is a good one to turn on because it's really fun to see where your photos were taken on a map like this. And it'll allow you to find and see all of your photos taken in particular locations. But if you're not interested in this, then having location on or off won't affect your experience of the app in any way. Next, these grid options are really useful for helping you compose your photographs. So you've got a square, the rule of thirds, and the golden ratio. If you primarily upload your photos to Instagram, then the square can be useful for making sure your photo will look good in your grid. I always have the rule of thirds turned on, and the golden ratio is also a thing that exists. <laughs> and when you turn any of the grids on, some cool levels will automatically appear. You have tilt and roll to help you keep your phone level and straight, which is nice. And the reticles turn blue when you're in the ballpark. Tilting the phone too far though will cause the levels to disappear. 
Next, I'm going to recommend turning this volume button shutter option on as it allows you to press the lower volume button to take a picture. And if you hold it down, it's going to capture a burst of photos. And this can be really useful for quickly snapping photos one-handed, and it allows you to keep a better two-handed grip of your phone as well. Just be aware that there is a bit of a delay when taking photos with the lower volume button and sometimes it just straight up ignores me and on my iPhone 12 Pro it'll actually try to lower the volume at the same time as taking a photo and if this happens just just restart the app. Um, I have absolutely no idea what this does. I've tried to figure it out and I don't know so if you have any ideas feel free to let me know in the comments. <laughs> Moving on to photo settings where you can choose which image formats you'd like to shoot in. This first one is your processed image format the app calls the standard image format and here you can choose whether you want to shoot in the new high format which stands for high efficiency image file or the good old-fashioned jpeg which in case you're wondering stands for joint photographic experts group so there you go and while the high format typically produces a smaller file size and can hold more color information than a jpeg you probably won't see any difference between the two so this isn't a particularly important choice but i kind of arbitrarily always choose high then go down to processed photo quality this is a more important setting and just make sure it's on quality this will ensure you're capturing the highest quality processed images possible speed sacrifices quality to deliver your photo faster and balanced is like in between the two but speed sacrifices a fair bit of image quality for a pretty non-discernible increase in capture speed so you may as well just get the highest quality you can and on the 12 Pro slash 12 Pro Max, you have a choice between RAW and Pro RAW. But on other devices like this 10R, you get RAW or RAW plus JPEG. And I'm not sure why they would swap RAW plus JPEG for Pro RAW instead of just adding it to the list of options. But here we are. Now let's go through some basic shooting techniques you can do in the Moment app and then move on to some more advanced ones. So the first and most basic is the universal camera app action of tapping on the screen to activate the autofocus, auto exposure and auto white balance as confirmed by a reticle. And after you tap, you can move the reticle around the screen and you can also tap and hold to lock it with the reticle turning blue to confirm it's locked and to unlock it, simply tap somewhere else. But that's not all because you can also split the reticle by double tapping it. So now this one with the points is your focus reticle and this one with the sun is your exposure and white balance. And having the two is way and beyond more useful than the single reticle because you can now focus on one thing while exposing for another. And this is particularly useful in situations like this where I can expose for the sky in the background while focusing on the sign in the foreground. You can still tap and hold to lock and just tap and hold again or move one to unlock. And to reunite them, simply drag one over the top of the other or double tap. Another way to adjust your exposure is with EV. EV stands for exposure value and you can just tap it then adjust the slider to change your exposure. You can also tap on the slider to adjust it in the smallest increments. After you've done this, you can still tap to focus and expose, but the overall exposure will be brighter or darker depending on how you've set this number. To reset the EV, simply double tap it. Splitting the reticles will also reset the EV, but you can set it again and then continue to move the reticles as needed. And this workflow with the reticles and the EV slider is perfect for shooting in a processed image format like Hive, JPEG, TIFF or Pro RAW because what you see on the screen is how your photo is going to look. But with RAW, what you see on the screen isn't how your photo is going to look, so there is more work to do. So let's get a bit more advanced with the histogram and the clipping warnings. And when you're shooting in RAW, these things are your best friend as they tell you how to expose. The histogram is already on by default. So come into the exposure and focus settings and turn on the clipping warnings. Clipping essentially means something is too dark or too bright. So when you see the warnings appear, you can adjust your settings accordingly. The histogram on the other hand is a look at where the tonal values in your scene really are. From left to right, we have blacks, 
shadows, midtones, highlights, and whites. In this example, the histogram is telling us there's lots of data between the shadows and the midtones. And when it bunches up at the right here, it means part of the image is way too bright. And the image itself reveals that that's true. So let's use the clipping warnings and the histogram in moment to fix this. Right now, the highlight clipping, the red one, is telling me the sky is way too bright. So I can bring the EV down, but as I do, the shadows then start to clip as well because the exposure range in the scene is very large. So I have a choice. Do I potentially sacrifice some detail in the shadows in order to save the sky? Yeah, I want to do that because raw files are so data rich, I can always lift the shadows later. And the histogram confirms that we're going to see lots of darks and shadows, not much in the midtones, and then a little bump in the highlights. And that's exactly the photo we got. And that's how to use the exposure guides in the Moment app. For me though, a better method of setting your exposure is with the manual controls, the ISO and the shutter speed. Just like with EV, to set your ISO and shutter speed, just tap on the one you want and adjust the slider as needed. And now that I've started to adjust the ISO, notice how the shutter speed has also locked and this will always happen. You can't adjust either one of these two without automatically locking the other and also resetting the EV again. They're linked together and to reset them, just double tap on either. And if you tap on the viewfinder while you're using them, you can set the focus, which I use a lot, but the exposure will not change. Using the ISO and shutter speed is advantageous because you have the most control and it's faster to just keep your ISO as low as possible for the best image quality. Then adjust the shutter speed while keeping an eye on the histogram and the clipping warnings. Let's carry on down the line of manual controls to the white balance and it's very simple really. Right now it's in AWB which stands for auto white balance and you just drag the slider until the colors in your photo look how you want them to look. So you've got 1800 Kelvin, which is very cold, obviously, all the way up to 9800 Kelvin, which is very warm. As with the other sliders, the white balance will remain locked until you double tap on the screen or double tap on the setting itself. Next, we've got the manual focus. And as you might expect at this point, to use it, tap Auto F and then drag the slider from left to right to bring the focus closer and right to left to bring it further away. This really helpful green focus peaking should be on by default and the stronger you have the green, the more you're in focus. It can take a bit of getting used to, but if you want to or need to focus manually, then it's definitely worth leaving on. But if you do want to turn it off, you can do so in the settings under focus and exposure. Finally, the most advanced thing Thing you can do in photo mode is bracketing. Bracketing is where you take a sequence of photos of the same thing at different exposures and you might want to do this when the exposure range in the scene is too great for a single photo. For example, if your scene has very dark shadows and very bright highlights at the same time, then bracketing could be your solution as you can easily assign different areas to different exposures. In this situation, I've got details across the tonal range. I've got highlights in the sky, midtones in the monument and on the grass and in the building and shadows in the background. And one single photo isn't enough to get a good exposure on all three. So I can use bracketing in the moment app to take three different exposures of the same thing. So with bracketing turned on, first set your exposure using any method that you like. I'm going to use the manual controls and pay attention to the histogram and try to get it somewhere in the middle, not too bright and not too dark. Then come over to BKT, which stands for bracket, and this middle point represents your current exposure. This is your first photo in the sequence. These positive numbers represent a brighter second exposure and I'm going to use this one to bring out the details in the background. So I'm going to estimate how much brighter the exposure needs to be. And I'm gonna choose one and three quarter stops brighter. These negative numbers represent a darker third exposure. So here I'm looking to expose for the bright sky and I think I'll go for another one and three quarter stops. With those set, I can tap the shutter and the app will automatically take the three photos at the three different exposures. 
and the rest of the process takes place outside of the Moment app in Lightroom. So I can combine our three photos together in Lightroom and there is our high dynamic range photo. So bracketing can be really useful once you get your head around how it works. Uh, just don't forget to turn it off after you've finished with it. I've left it on by accident a few times and I've been like, what the heck is wrong with my exposure? Oh yeah, bracketing is on. And one final thing about photo mode is its integration with the darkroom app. If you have darkroom installed, it'll appear here when you review a photo. You can tap the darkroom logo and open your photo straight into it. This is really convenient for me because I can just jump quickly into darkroom and see what my raw files really look like and then come back into the moment app. So that's photo mode. And yes, there are things that I've not covered like presets and the lens options, but as you can apply these things to all the different modes, I'm going to cover them all together at the end along with Siri shortcuts and Apple Watch integration. So onto photo mode's cousin, slow shutter mode. Slow shutter mode allows you to create those sweet long exposures, but they're not real long exposures. The app is taking multiple photos as time passes and blending them all together in some really clever way to give you a long exposure effect. And it's important to know this in order to get the most out of the slow shutter mode as you'll see. But before I continue, let me quickly mention that slow shutter mode is an optional in-app purchase of three 99, but you can get it together with the time-lapse mode for a bundle of 499. So with that said, let's create some sweet long exposures. The first thing is you'll need a tripod or at least to keep your phone perfectly still as the picture is being taken because any movement whatsoever from your camera will ruin your photo. I like to put my phone on my little Joby and on my full-size tripod. And the two keys to slow shutter mode are these two effects down here, motion blur and light trails. Let's start with motion blur. This is for daytime situations and it works really well for the usual long exposure subjects like running water, clouds, and for making people disappear. Once your phone is sturdy and you've composed your shot, you can set your focus, exposure, and white balance however you like, whether that's with the reticles, EV, or the manual controls, it really doesn't matter and you don't need to pay attention to the clipping warnings or the histogram because what you see on the screen is what your result is going to look like. And if you've skipped right to the slow shutter section and don't know how to use the exposure controls, then go to this timestamp and then come back here. So I'm just gonna use the reticles. I'm going to expose here, focus here, set the white balance to whatever looks good and bring the EV down a bit. Then I'm going to come over to motion blur and this is how long the exposure is going to last in seconds. So you've got half a second, which is way too short. Then we have one, two, four, eight seconds, all the way up to 30 seconds and bulb, which is infinity. The exposure will stop when you tell it to. And choosing the right amount of time really depends on what you're shooting. If you're shooting a fast moving waterfall like this, then anything between one second, two seconds, four seconds will do. But if you're shooting some slow moving clouds, then you're gonna to want to try 30 seconds or bulb to give the clouds a chance to move significantly across the frame. So I'll set my motion blur and tap the shutter. And when I do, you can see the picture building over time, which is cool. And you can also stop it by tapping the shutter again. Just make sure you tap the shutter carefully so you don't nudge the phone because any movement from the phone whatsoever will ruin your long exposure. If you're concerned about nudging your phone and shaking the camera when you tap to take the photo, then you can set the timer to three seconds or you can trigger the shutter with your Apple Watch, which I'll go into at the end. So that's motion blur. Now let's move on to light trails. Now light trails do require a bit more work to get them to look their best. And this is where a knowledge of how the effect actually works really comes in. First of all, you'll need to make sure that it's actually dark enough for the lights to stand out against their surroundings. If you don't, then the effect won't work particularly well, whether you get the settings right or not. Next, instead of using the reticles or EV, we're going to use ISO and shutter speed because the shutter speed actually affects the length of the light trails. 
For example, if I choose a fast shutter speed, the light trails end up looking more like Morse code, like dots and dashes, instead of smooth continuous lines. And this is because it's taking multiple photos one after the other in very quick succession. To correct this, set the shutter speed as slow as you can. In this situation, when it's not completely dark, I can get to a quarter or a third of a second, and I'll have to bring the ISO down as low as possible. And now our light trails start to look a lot more natural, more continuous. Still not perfect, but you're never going to get perfectly continuous light trails because of how the effect works. And one more thing about slow shutter mode is that the photos are actually live photos. When you review your slow shutter photos, if you tap the live photos icon or tap and hold on the photo itself, you can watch your photos form. And when you export it, you get to choose between JPEG and MOV. JPEG will give you the still photo and MOV will give you a video, which is very cool. And that is slow shutter mode. And now onto Moment's other $3.99 in-app purchase, time-lapse mode. Just like slow shutter mode, make sure you're using a tripod to keep your phone as still and steady as you can, because if it's shaking or moving around, then your time-lapse will probably be ruined. In terms of interface, the motion blur and light trail effects that we just saw in the slow shutter mode are still here, but they're now also joined by some image formats, different resolutions, and the most obvious addition is the time-lapse interface element itself. So let's create some awesome time-lapses. First, choose your image format and resolution. I always go for TIFF and max resolution, and I choose TIFF kind of arbitrarily because I can't actually see any difference between the image formats. And I always choose max because it uses the full image sensor and I can always crop it to 4K or 1080p later. Next, I set my white balance, focus and exposure. And for these, you have all of the same controls as the other modes. And if you've skipped straight to time-lapse mode and don't know how the white balance, the focus and the exposure settings work, then feel free to watch the sections at the timestamps first. As a time-lapse is a video, I really don't want any of my settings changing as it progresses, so I set everything manually. I don't use the exposure reticle or the EV, and I make sure the focus is locked. Next, I choose how many frames I want to capture and the intervals between them. It's set to infinity by default, so it'll keep going until you tell it to stop. Or you can specify a certain number based on how long you want your time-lapse to last. I always aim for at least 400 frames, so it gives me a decent length time-lapse, and I set the intervals depending on how fast my subject is moving. So for traffic, I choose the shortest I can, 0.4, to 0.5 seconds. For moving people, I choose one second, and for weather and clouds, I choose two seconds. And when you specify a number of frames, as you change the intervals, the capture time and output time will react. So this time-lapse of 420 frames with two second intervals is going to take 14 minutes to capture and give me a final 14 second time-lapse. If I reduce the intervals to one second, it'll take seven minutes to capture, but the output time will remain the same. And there's one more thing to consider before you tap the shutter, and that is the motion blur and light trail effects. Now these effects are really cool and can take your time lapses to the next level of awesomeness. To add motion blur to your time lapses, tap effect, come to motion blur and then choose how much blur you want. These numbers refer to the amount of time in seconds the blur will last per frame. So with 0.5, each frame in your time lapse will get half a second of motion blur. So let's see what this looks like. I've chosen my settings, I've got my frames, intervals and motion blur locked in. And when I start the time lapse, you can see the motion blurring over the course of each frame. Light trails are a little bit different. These numbers do represent how long the light trail will last, but it's not enough just to select the amount of time. In order to create smooth, continuous looking trails, you also need to use a slow shutter speed. So here my exposure is okay, but my shutter speed is way too fast and it's causing the light trails to be really short and janky looking. Definitely not what we want but it's an easy fix. So I'm going to slow the shutter speed way down, decrease the ISO to balance the exposure, 
and go again. Now with the slower shutter speed, the light trails are much longer and look a lot more natural. If you have a gimbal, literally any gimbal, you can also use these effects to create some really eye-catching hyperlapses. And if you want to learn how to do that, there's a link on the screen now. But if you have a DJI Osmo Mobile, you can also program it to move through a predefined path as it captures the time lapse like this. And to see that, go to this timestamp. And finally, there is one more very important part of time lapse mode, and that is exporting. So after you've captured your time lapse, come into the reviewer and go over to time lapses. And when you tap on one, don't play it back straight away. Wait for this blue circle to finish loading and disappear first, because if you don't, it won't play back in full. Once it's done, you can watch it, then tap export and choose your settings. So you've got format, resolution, quality, which is measured in bitrate, and frames per second. H.264 is the most widely used video format. You'll have no problem playing it back and editing it on any device. HEVC is the same quality as H.264, but the file sizes should be smaller. However, you may have issues playing it back and editing it on older or slower devices. And finally, if you choose JPEG, you'll get each individual frame from your time-lapse saved as a photo, a moment's going to helpfully automatically put them into an album for you. Next, you have your resolution. This is pretty self-explanatory, and if you shot in max resolution, you can export as one of the other smaller resolutions, but you'll get cropping. So I'd recommend exporting in the resolution you shot in and then downscaling later in an editing app. The quality of the export is measured in bitrate. And if you have the space available, just always go for the highest bitrate you can. It's as simple as that. Finally, there's frames per second. How many frames are going to play back every second? And you can see the effect this has on the video. So 60 frames per second, for example, packs in way more frames every second, resulting in smoother playback. But you'll also get a much shorter, faster video. It just depends on what you want, how many frames are actually available, what you captured, etc. Then tap export and this blue line will let you keep track of your process. And that's it. That is the time lapse mode. Now, last and certainly not least, is Moments Fantastic Video Mode. The user interface contains three different picture profiles, default, flat, and log. You've got your resolutions and frame rates, but your frame rates will change depending on which resolution you're in. So this iPhone 12 Pro, for example, at 1080p gets 24 frames per second all the way up to 240 whereas 4K goes from 24 to 60. Pretty standard stuff. And you've got the lens selector again, which I go through at this timestamp here. Underneath, actually on the viewfinder itself, are your audio levels. You have an icon telling you which microphone is in use and the volume for if you're monitoring the audio through headphones. The camera switcher options are still here too, but now on the other side is a waveform and an RGB histogram to help you monitor your exposure and colors. And finally, the manual controls are still here at the very bottom. All of the focus and exposure controls work in the exact same way as all of the other modes. You've still got your reticles, you've got your EV, etc. And if you want to see how they work, go to this timestamp. But for video mode, I wouldn't recommend using the exposure reticle and EV. I'd highly recommend using the manual controls exclusively as I'll get into. But first we need to do a bit of housekeeping. So let's head into the settings and scroll down to video settings and into standard video format, which is where you can choose your, well, video format. You've got H.264 and HEVC, which stands for high efficiency video codec, also known as H.265. H.264 is an extremely widely used format and literally everything 
supports it. HEVC or H.265 is a newer format that essentially gives you the same quality as H.264 at a lower bit rate with lower file sizes. So you'll save space filming in HEVC, but you may run into performance and compatibility issues when you try and play it back or edit it on certain older devices. So to be on the safe side, I'm going to recommend sticking to H.264. Next, I'm going to also highly recommend you turn on stabilization. It really is a no brainer. Even if you're using a gimbal, the stabilization in the app will make a huge difference, but it works by cropping into your footage. And because of this, I also recommend shooting in 4K if you can. NTSC or PAL allow you to use the frame rates from different regions. Here in the UK, I'm in the PAL region, but as I upload my videos to YouTube, it's pretty irrelevant as YouTube is regionless, as is the rest of the internet. But as I like to shoot in a cinematic 24 frames per second, I stick exclusively with NTSC. And below that is bitrate. This is the amount of data or bits used to encode your video every second, but it basically translates to image quality. So you have standard, which they don't state, but it's around 30 to 35, maybe 40 megabits per second. Medium, which is 60 and high, which is 100. Now these are the 4K bit rates. These aren't for 1080p. The 1080p bit rates are a lot lower than this, but regardless, the higher the bit rate, the better quality your video is going to be, but you will get bigger file sizes. Finally, we have the RGB histogram and the waveform. These are exposure and color guides for your video, and they can be really important because the brightness of your screen doesn't always reflect how your exposure is going to look. This waveform allows you to see what the exposure is really doing, and from top to bottom, left to right, it's a direct representation of the viewfinder. Highlights are at the top and the shadows are at the bottom. So the waveform is telling me this scene is well exposed. And when it bunches up at the top and bottom here, that means it's clipping, it's losing information. So these areas of highlight clipping are the little windows at the top and this area of shadow clipping is the karaoke machine. And you can see how useful this is when I turn my screen brightness down. It looks like I'm underexposed now, but the waveform is telling me the overall exposure is fairly bright. The highlight and shadow clipping warnings will also tell you where you're clipping, but they can be a bit intrusive and distracting when you're filming. For your colors, the RGB histogram works just like the other histogram we looked at in the photo mode section. The blacks and shadows are over to the left, and the more right you go, the brighter you get except this time you've got each color channel, red, green, and blue. And this allows you to see how prevalent different colors are in different areas of your image. And this can help you with your white balance. When the histogram is white, that means all of the colors are represented in that area. But when you see the colors themselves, that means one or more colors are missing. Looking at the histogram here, it's telling me there's lots of yellow in the highlights, which makes sense because the wall is yellow. And since yellow is a mixture of green and red, that means a lack of blue, which is perfectly fine for this situation. So you can use this information to ensure an accurate white balance. So much yellow in the highlights could mean the white balance is too warm, so I can make it cooler and try to introduce some blues back into that area. Now let's move on to picture profiles. Picture profiles are really cool because they allow you to get even more out of your image. The default profile is the iPhone's standard color profile, which is very vibrant and contrasty. The flat profile removes some contrast and saturation and the log profile takes it even further. And you can see the difference these profiles make in the waveform. Clipping is reported in the default profile, but when we switch to flat and log, that reduction in contrast has resulted in a worse looking image in the camera, but more information is available to give you more options and flexibility for color grading later. So as I said before, I highly recommend using the manual controls when shooting video, and this is for a few reasons. The first is the ability to save them as a preset. So you can switch your entire setup almost instantly, which I'll show you in a minute. 
The second is so you can keep your ISO as low as possible for maximum video quality, especially in low light. And the third is because certain shutter speeds can result in flicker in your video and produce janky motion blur. And to avoid both of these things, you want to set your shutter speed to double your frame rate, something the reticles will not do. So if you've chosen 24 as your frame rate, set your shutter speed to 1 48th or a 50th. And doing this is known as the 180 degree shutter rule. But alas, this is a moment app tutorial and not a how to shoot video with your iPhone tutorial. So I must keep talking about the app, but I will link to another video I have where I take you through how to shoot cinematic video with your iPhone. So when you hit record, your settings will disappear to give you a clearer view of your composition, but you can still access them here if you want to change them mid recording. In fact, all of the exposure and focus controls still work the exact same way during recording. You can still bring up the reticles, split them, lock them, etc. And again, if you want to see how those work, go to this timestamp. Now, in case you weren't aware, it's the current year. And in the current year, video also comes with audio and Moment has some great audio controls. So let's head back into the settings and scroll all the way down to audio settings. Your audio levels are these things here. This is a measurement of how intense your audio signal is, which basically tells you how loud your audio is going to be in decibels. When the levels are green, you're safe. When they turn yellow, you're on the nose and want to be careful not to get much louder. And when they hit this red line, your audio is clipping, which basically means it's too loud for the phone's amplifier, which causes a loss in audio quality. Sample rate refers to how many times sound is sampled per second. The more samples you have, the higher quality your audio recording, apparently since most people can't actually tell the difference between 44.1 kilohertz and 48 kilohertz. Think of it like this, 44.1 kilohertz is like CD quality sound and 48 kilohertz is like DVD quality sound. So you'll be fine with either, but I go with 48 kilohertz. Bit depth refers to how much dynamic range is available in your recording. It doesn't refer to the dynamic range of the audio, it refers to the range of decibels that is supported. So the more the merrier, right? Well, you're very unlikely to actually need all of the dynamic range available in 24 or even 16 bits. But like everything, I like to choose the highest quality I can whether I need it or not. But if file size is a concern for you, if you absolutely have to save space on your device, then go with 16 bit. Up next, you have stereo or mono. When you listen to audio with two earbuds or two speakers, that sound could be a mono recording simply playing back in both the left and right channels. And when that's the case, the sound is exactly the same in both ears as if someone is talking directly in front of you. But with a stereo recording, the sound is slightly different in both ears as if you're in a room and groups of people are talking all around you. Stereo recording should provide a more immersive sound, especially if your subject is moving across the screen. And when you record in stereo, you can actually see in the levels how one level is recording louder sounds than the other one. Whereas with mono, they're the same. Now let's talk about microphones. Your iPhone should have four built-in microphones, one at the back next to the camera module, one at the front and two at the bottom. And these do make a difference depending on what you're recording and where. Now, I don't know anything technical about these microphones. I can just go off what I hear and you can go off what you hear. So the bottom microphone is like a jack of all trades. It's more omnidirectional. So it's gonna pick up sounds even when they're not directly in front of the camera. But when I'm talking to the camera like this in more of a vlog style or similar, I like to use the back microphone as it just sounds more directional, more focused on me in front of the camera and excludes 
some of the other sounds around it. And when using the selfie camera, the front facing microphone performs in a very similar way, but a lot of this is personal preference. So I recommend just trying out each one and seeing what sounds best for you. You can also monitor the volume with a pair of headphones and you can adjust the volume by tapping here. So now I can hear my own voice, which is weird. So I'm gonna turn that down. Yeah, I don't like that. But when you attach a pair of headphones like these, the microphone automatically switches to this one here, which leads me on nicely to external microphones. But instead of one of these, a lot of iPhone filmmakers will use one of these. But in order to connect an external microphone like this to your phone, you're going to need one of these TRS to TTRS 3.5 millimeter cables, and you're gonna need an adapter as well. When you connect your external mic, you'll see this indicator change to headset, letting you know that you've successfully attached it and you'll get a new gain option. Think of gain as the microphone's sensitivity. And as you increase the gain, you can see what effect this has on the levels. So be careful not to set the gain too high. In this situation, when I'm about arm's length away from the microphone and I'm talking at a normal conversation level, I set the gain to around 0.85 and you can still adjust it while you're recording. Moment also has Shure MV88 Plus integration, but I don't have one of those, but I do have some wireless earbuds. Do you remember way, way back at the start of this tutorial? It seems so long ago now when Moment asked us to use Bluetooth. Well, this is why, because you can use these as a wireless microphone. If they're paired to your phone already, when you turn them on and they connect, then the Moment app should automatically switch. Okay, what was that? <laughs> I really don't know what that was. Hopefully now you can hear me talking into the JBL microphone. So what I was saying was, when I can hear myself again, I don't like it, turn that down. Okay, so what I was saying was, when you're using these as a microphone and you can hear yourself speaking as well, you can't then plug in a separate pair of headphones to monitor the audio as well. So say I'm filming someone and I give them the microphone speaking, I can't then, I can't then monitor the audio separate pair of headphones. When you plug the headphones in, then the app just gets confused and crashes. <laughs> You've just seen how confused the app can get first hand with my, with my chipmunk impression. And I tell you what, I've actually enjoyed filming uh, this last little section with the phone and the Moment app and this so much. I'm actually gonna film the rest of this tutorial with this setup. So, back into the settings and what does this lonely little option refer to? Well, it refers to these, the lens options. Each of these refers to a specific moment lens that you can use with your phone. No lens is on by default. W is moments 18 millimeter wide. T is their 58 or 60 millimeter telephoto. M is their 25 millimeter macro. F15 is their 15 millimeter fisheye, A is for 1.33 times anamorphic, and finally, F14 is their 14 millimeter fisheye. And all of these lens options bar one do absolutely nothing. They're simply a way of keeping track in the metadata of which lens you used. So you select wide and nothing happens. Telephoto, nothing happens until you get to fisheye, where in photo mode, a distortion slider appears next to the white balance, but the main one is anamorphic. This will apply a 1.33 times de-squeeze to your frame. So if you're using a 1.33 times anamorphic lens, you can shoot with a better visualization of your final widescreen result. And this de-squeeze option works with all modes except for when you're shooting in raw when you're shooting in raw you can see the preview of the de-squeeze but the file itself won't actually be de-squeezed but with literally everything else whether that's video time lapses slow shutter mode photos or processed photos you can tick this little box here and you can apply a de-squeeze not only to the viewfinder but to the file afterwards 
If you don't have this option selected, then you'll still see a preview of your D squeeze on the phone when you're filming or shooting, but the actual file itself will be left alone. Okay, let's switch back to the main camera because I didn't want people to skip to this part in the video and just see that I'm on now some, some random angle on my phone with worse sounding audio. So let's talk about presets. This preset button has been present throughout the tutorial in all four different modes. This is a really useful option because it allows you to switch between saved modes and settings extremely quickly. So let's say I'm taking a time lapse and I quickly want to switch to video mode, but I don't just want video mode, I want my cinematic video settings, which can take time to dial in. So I just tap preset, choose my cinematic video preset and I'm good to go, everything is set. If you tap edit up here, you can delete presets and rearrange them. To make a new preset, simply set yourself up however you like. So I want an ultra slow motion preset. So I'm going to set it all up and then tap create new preset. And I can check my preset looks good, name it and save. But we're just getting started with time saving automation because Moment also works with Siri. Tapping this eye icon will bring up your preset details and at the bottom here, you've got an add to Siri option, which allows you to activate your preset with your voice and add the preset to your phone's home screen. But to show you this, I'm going to go back. I'm going to head into the settings and choose add Siri shortcut. Here's our presets again. And when I tap open preset, it's going to walk me through it. So when I say open cinematic video, open the preset, which preset? Well, we can tap and we can choose. I'm going to choose my super slow-mo preset. Then I'm going to go back and change this command to bullet time. Done, add to Siri. And there it is. So now when I say, hey Siri, bullet time, moment opens into my super slow motion preset. But this only works when outside of the app because when moment is open, Siri ignores me. But you don't have to open into a preset. You can open into any mode that you like and you don't even have to speak to your phone. You can add your preset to the home screen. Just go into the Siri shortcuts app itself, find your preset, tap the menu, then tap add to home screen. Tap the icon, choose anything that you'd like. You can rename it if you want, then tap add, done and done. And there it is. Moment also has home screen widgets. So come across to your widgets, tap edit, tap the plus, search moment, tap add widget and then you can keep it here or drag it to your home screen. You can then tap and hold on it, tap edit widget and choose which preset you'd like to open it into. Next, Moment works with the Apple Watch. When the app is open, tap the Moment icon, tap connect and you should get a preview of the viewfinder on your Apple Watch. If it doesn't work straight away, then try relaunching the app on both your phone and the Apple Watch. Once it's open and connected, you can force press on the watch to switch modes and shoot. And finally, Moment also has DJI Osmo Mobile 3 integration. And this is another reason why the app wanted access to Bluetooth. I love this. I have the Osmo Mobile 3, so that's the one I'll be demonstrating and your Osmo device might perform differently. So with the Osmo Mobile 3 turned on, I'll come into the settings in the Moment app and tap Osmo Mobile. It should automatically pick up the device and I'll tap connect and pair. You can then flip through a short tutorial, which is going to tell you how you can shoot with this red button, how you can use this slider to adjust a setting of your choice and how you can tap M to change cameras. But that's not all it does. You can also program a path in time-lapse mode, which is awesome. So in time-lapse mode with the gimbal connected, this path option appears, which I can tap on and set a path for the gimbal to follow. Just choose your starting point, tap plus, then move the gimbal with your joystick and add up to four different points. Once you've set your path, you need to also choose a number of frames as this doesn't work with infinite frames. And once you've done that, tap the shutter to begin the time-lapse and watch the gimbal 
move through the path. And if I'm not mistaken, that's everything I wanted to cover, which means that this is the end of the tutorial. I would sincerely love to know what you've learned and how the tutorial has helped you get more out of the Moment app. And feel free to share your results with me on Instagram at PisicalMau. In the meantime, I'm going to start work on my next video and continue living my life with strength, honor, and curiosity. David out. And, and, and finally, Moment has Osmo, and finally, Moment has DJI Osmo Mobile. <laughs> okay. And, and finally, Moment has DJI Mobile Osmo, Osmo Mobile. And fin, and finally, D, <sighs> so many brands and names. And, and finally, Moment also has a DJI Osmo Mobile 3 integration, and this is again why it wanted to use Bluetooth.